Welcome to episode four of TMI, the Melanin Initiative podcast. Today's episode is all about advocacy. Healthcare advocacy. Welcome to episode four of TMI, the Melanin <laughs> We're going to have like a blue version. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to episode four of TMI, the Melanin Initiative podcast. Today's episode is all about advocacy. Healthcare advocacy is defined by the National Association of Healthcare Advocacy as the act of supporting another individual with their ability to make well-informed decisions regarding medical, behavioral, and or financial circumstances. The primary objective is to provide safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable health care. For all, regardless of your age, race, sex, gender identity, income, education, religion, language, and income status. Geraldine, what do you think of when you hear the word advocacy? So whenever I think of healthcare advocacy, um, well, generally when people hear of healthcare advocacy, they think of like a older patients needing a healthcare advocate or a person who is very sick. Um, But I'm here to tell you that everyone needs a healthcare advocate, not just the very, you know, our elderly patients, not just our extremely sick patients. Everyone. Um, Everyone needs an advocate. For example, uh, recently I had a patient come into my clinic and um, he was young, 19 year old. He had really bad abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. He can barely like communicate with me that, you know, what was going on. I could kind of already see what was going on. I already noticed that he was severely dehydrated, very weak, could barely walk or stand because he felt like he was going to pass out because he was dehydrated. Um, fortunately, you know, I started off the visit with him with it was just me and him. And um, after assessing him, I made a recommendation that I felt that he needed to go to the emergency room. Fortunately for him, um, he had a friend with him that was in the waiting room and I asked his permission to uh, allow that friend to come into the room so we can kind of discuss next steps because I felt that he needed to go to the ER. And it was great that he had that friend there because she was the one that kind of made sure that we, you know, she called an Uber, made sure that he got to the Uber, got into the Uber and got to the hospital. But that was, the hospital was pretty much down the street, but he still needed assistance getting there. Um, She was also uh, very helpful as far as contacting his parents, kind of like uh, keeping them up to date with what was going on because the patient, once again, was in pretty bad shape and couldn't really communicate um, with his parents or didn't really want to talk to anyone because he was in so much pain and was just so like out of it. So um, that, you know, kind of goes to just show how like you you don't have to be um, old or extremely sick or or, like unconscious (laughs) to have like a healthcare advocate, um, you know. Uh, And on the other hand, our older patients also need, like everyone, not just older patients, once again, need healthcare advocates, but um, older patients tend to have like a little soft spot in my heart as far as advocacy is concerned, because they tend to have a lot more chronic conditions. um, And sometimes they have more than one thing going on with them. They can have, um, I've had patients come in that have like, they're dealing with high blood pressure, um, diabetes and high cholesterol. So it's just kind of like, that's the trifecta. Um, so it's just a lot to deal with and a lot to manage all on your own. Um, so it's very important for those patients to have uh, a healthcare advocate. And that could be any, that could be a family member or it could be a, a close friend like or a neighbor that they feel that they can confide in and that they feel that they can trust um, uh, helping them with their healthcare. Um, keep in mind that as we get older, it's uh, harder for like older patients to find an uh, advocate because a lot of times they've outlived some of their family members. Um, so that's why they tend to turn to like family fr- or like a friend or a, a close neighbor um, to kind of help them. But no matter the age, having an advocate can be very beneficial, especially when you're in pain or you're overwhelmed with just life in general. So it's very important to have an advocate. You're right, Geraldine, and I think most people would agree with us that advocacy is important. But in my experience, what has been one of the biggest barriers to people actually utilizing an advocate is trust. Mm -hmm. Trust is a real issue in every community and one that has to be addressed. We can definitely understand where finding someone you trust can be challenging. Tension between loved ones, wanting to keep aspects of your health private, not wanting to add stress to other family members. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you're the primary breadwinner or maybe you're the only one the only person someone has, like a single parent, we get it. It can be difficult. 
But more often than not, people always wish they had someone there. Mm -hmm. But what's important is to at least have an emergency contact. And really, you should have two. Because what if that first person isn't available? And recognize that anxiety, depression, and loneliness of managing disease is real. It can hinder your ability to understand what's going on and think clearly. Um, so sometimes there are changes that take place within your body and we wonder, is this normal? Mm -hmm. So as clinicians, um, we, we don't always know when those subtle changes are taking place, if that's just you or if we should be concerned about that particular change. So, um, for example, we may have an elderly, um, young an elderly young woman, an elderly woman <laughs> come into uh, the hospital. Um, she came in confused and, you know, looked a little disheveled. And, um, you know, we're, 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 we are very concerned about this, you know, this lady. We're like, what's going on with her? But we get in contact with a family friend, her neighbor, and they say, well, you know, she's always kind of like this. And, uh, well, she's usually a little off but she doesn't usually look disheveled. So mm -hmm. that's what really has us concerned is that she's not able to really put her clothes on like she used to. She doesn't seem as cleanly as she used to. That's our real concern. But, you know, she's always been a little, you know, out there. That kind of provides us with a little bit more context of how to care for you if there are others around you to describe um, your day-to-day -day mannerisms and certain things. You know, maybe there's certain food that you don't eat, but you're not really able to speak for yourself. Um, having that person say she doesn't like green beans. So every day you bring her green beans, it's not that she has poor intake. She don't like green beans. So those are important things for us to know. And only an advocate um, can provide that knowledge to us. So again, we encourage you to sit and think about at least two people who you could call on to be an advocate. They can be a friend, family member, coworker, church or community member, a friend of a friend, or a healthcare friend of a friend. <laughs> the National Association of Healthcare Advocacy has a wonderful directory of experienced professionals where you can find an advocate, or if you're a clinician listening to this and you wanna be added, uh, you can put yourself on there and serve in that capacity. That's where we found the Washington DC Healthcare Advocates and we'll have their information in the show notes. We'll include their contact information on Facebook as well. Uh, they can help you with care coordination, medical house calls, mediation, they can be a liaison serving as your eyes and ears, insurance, safety and residential analysis, making sure it's safe for you to go home, or what adjustments need to be made so that then it's safe for you to go home, like moving rugs, adding lighting, adding an extra uh, rail on the wall so you can walk up and down the stairs safely, putting up a ramp in front of the front or back door, little things like that, um, and life documents such as advanced care directives. Advocates are there to help you. They can do as little or as much as you need or desire. Uh, and so this is actually a, a great time for me. I want to share my story about my mom. I've shared it publicly and she's very vocal about her diagnosis of breast cancer. Uh, she got diagnosed with breast cancer my junior, my third year in nursing school. So I still had one more year left to go and I was living in Memphis. She lives in Virginia. And so I just physically could not be there for her. However, and she was like working full time and in grad school full time at Howard, the real HU. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, uh, it couldn't have been really a better situation. So first of all, she found the lump on her own and she immediately made a doctor's appointment. It was like early April. She had a doctor's appointment in two weeks. In another two weeks, she had cut her locks. And then two weeks after that, she had surgery. And uh, wow. technically I was supposed to be there for the surgery, but they ended up bumping it up sooner. So I didn't, mm -hmm. I wasn't there for the surgery itself, but I was there for the discharge. People at her job cut their hair. She never attended one chemo session alone. People came from other states. They sat with her every session. I was there for the third to last session. It was on my birthday. And she worked all through surgery, treatment, uh, chemo, and radiation. People always talk about chemo, but, you know, chemo, like for, for her, everyone's chemo is different. But she had a session every four weeks, and she only had four sessions. But the radiation was like five days a week. Oh so God. she's commuting from Virginia to D.C., working full time, going to grad school and going to all these radiation sessions. And those she did go by herself. But everything else from the cutting her hair to chemo to walking, she was well supported. She also utilized every free resource that was out there. And she continues to work really closely with the Susan G. Komen organization, mm -hmm. uh, 
she even went on Capitol Hill. They paid for her and some other advocates to go up there and tell their story and advocate for more funding for other people diagnosed with breast cancer. I say people because we know that men and women, those who identify as male and female, can um, still get breast cancer. And so that's just a her little story that I like to share that even though we have a wonderful relationship with my mom and we spent a lot of time together, even with all of that, I still was not able to be there for her. And fortunately, she was able to be surrounded. She never felt alone. I never felt the stress of her being alone. I probably don't even know half of what she went through because she had those people there to lean on right. and, she, and she used them. She yeah. was not afraid to ask for help. Wow. I don't think I ever knew that story. Me neither. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. yeah. And hopefully we'll have her on one day and we'll have to stop her from talking. <laughs> uh, Alicia, um, so we did receive some questions from the audience. We thank you so much for sending in your questions to our email, which you'll be able to find in the show notes. Um, so let's go to the hospital setting and talk about healthcare advocacy, sure. advocacy because that's where Bring a lot of our on. questions come from. <laughs> so how can you request an advocate? So from my experience, um, you can request an advocate at any time during your stay. So you can let your nurse know, you can let the charge nurse know, you can let your provider know. You just let someone know that you would like to speak with an advocate and um, it's our duty to get someone in touch with you. So um, what does a what does a meeting with the advocate look like? So the advocate will come to your bedside and they usually have a one on one meeting with you. And they will sit down and they will listen. That's that's step one. They will sit and listen to whatever it is that you would like to share with them. Um, from my experience, a lot of times there's something that you're having a negative experience in the healthcare setting and you're seeking an advocate to kind of help bridge that gap for whatever that issue may be. So maybe you didn't get along with your nurse. Maybe you didn't get along with the provider. Maybe there's some information missing that you're looking for. Maybe, you know, you're looking to have a procedure. You don't know what time it's going to be. There's a anything that you feel um, you need further information, further knowledge, further assistance, support, whatever you need, the advocate is there to assist you. And it's important for you to know that oftentimes advocates are not medical professionals. Yeah. Um, they're not, they don't have a divided interest. They're not really, you know, they, their job is to be there for you. Now they will consult with your nurse, your doctor, or whomever is going to help bridge that gap to kind of solve the problem, but that they are not coming to you with kind of background knowledge in medicine. Mm -hmm. They, they are there to be your advocate. And you brought up a good thing about sit and listen. So one of the things patients complain about all the time is that nurses and doctors don't spend enough time with them. And, you know, that's not because we don't want to or we don't care. So the nurse, say on average, might have five, and now that I've traveled the country, six or eight patients, okay? And that's just at one point in time. They might be admitting someone or discharging someone. So in a whole 12-hour shift, they may have actually taken care of even more patients than that. Mm -hmm. And some people might be dying. Like you, there's, a, there's a lot going on. Someone might have just found out they have a terminal diagnosis. So they just literally, logistically, don't have time to sit with you. Same with the doctor. They might be taking care of 20, 30 patients in that shift. They just don't have time to sit with you. It doesn't mean they care any less. But our chaplains, our advocates have a lot of free time. They can sit and listen to your concerns. And like Alicia said, make sure the right person finds out that information and mm -hmm. assists you as you need. They're not utilized enough, honestly. Yeah. People don't recognize that they're part of the team. They're still part of the team and they have the time to give that you're looking for. And if the situation is, you know, serious enough, they conduct investigations. Mm -hmm. You know, I've definitely had advocates come to me and say, hey, this is a very serious allegation. You know, we're we're going to have to open an investigation about this. And these investigations continue even after you've been discharged. So we take, you know, patient advocates really take everything that you say serious and they really want to find resolution for you. And don't be afraid of a lot of patients will say, oh, I don't want to have anybody lose their job and get in trouble. Mm -hmm. That's not your concern. Your concern is what your concern is. Let the hospital worry about someone else's job. Let that clinician worry about their job. Truthfully, they're going to be very well supported. Don't worry about them being retaliated against. That's how we get better. That's how we improve our care. That's how we make sure this doesn't happen again. Okay? We welcome feedback. That's the only way we're going to get better. Uh, so uh, another question that an audience sent in is, what happens when I'm dish? Oh, what, did we already talk about what sort of things are discussed? Well, I, yeah, we, I mentioned that um, 
any concerns that the patient has. So they can bring them up um, with the patient advocate. So like I said, if you have any issue with your nurse or the provider or maybe you really feel like PTOT should be coming to see you three times a week. You know, you can talk to the patient advocate and they um, they will get you in contact with the person that's going to give you the best answer. Mm-hmm. Now, in that situation, it may not be an answer that you necessarily want to hear, right? right? right. The patient advocate's not going to create things that they cannot produce for you. So in that particular situation, PTOT is not coming to see you three times a week. However... It's your right to ask, right? We can't, you, nothing's going to be harmful or you asking and advocating for yourself. But there are some limitations. So the answer will maybe no sometimes. <laughs> you know, a great example that one of you touched on earlier. So one of the biggest complaints in the hospital is the food. Yes. Okay. So let's say, for instance, you have a particular thing, things that you like to eat or things you don't eat. You've mentioned it a few times to the person who brings your tray. You kind of mentioned it to the nurse. You didn't even try to tell it to the doctor. Okay. <laughs> and it's a, it's a real thing, right? You're really into your nutrition. You It's something that you're really invested in and nobody seems to care. Yeah. They're giving you, you're a diabetic and they're sending you all these carbs and they're giving you all this insulin that you've never taken before in your life and you don't like it. Nobody seems to care. You can talk to that advocate and just explain, look, part of my culture or part of the decisions I've made in my lifestyle. These are the kind of things I eat. I just want to have the things I eat so that I can actually have feel stronger, get stronger, go home and not have to go to rehab. That's something they can address. Mm -hmm. It seems like a simple thing because you came in there for abdominal pain, Mm -hmm. but food and sleep are two of the (laughs) biggest complaints. noise. (laughs) So there's no issue too small and no issue too big. Oh, and everybody, the other thing patients will always say is, you know, don't spend, go spend time with someone with other patients. They really need you. All you guys are important. Yeah. Everybody is needs us. We're there for everyone. No one is ranks higher in, in terms of whether or not we care or should spend time with you or that your issue is not of something of, of concern for us. Everyone is equal in that regard. What I mentioned previously about triaging, the sicker of the sicker, that's always going to be a thing. But your needs still matter. When we come spend time with you, that's, that's our primary concern at that time. So to wrap up, this up, the main TMI takeaway for today is that everyone needs an advocate, regardless of uh, the medical condition or your age. Under normal under normal circumstances, people only remember 30% of what you tell them. Um, add in the overwhelming amount of information shared during a healthcare appointment and the emotions and stress associated, and you can understand the importance of having somewhere um, someone there with you to make sure you get the healthcare that you need. In healthcare, there is often too much information and not enough time. Here at the Melanin Initiative, we avoid TMI by breaking things down into language that you can understand. We create a safe space for you to ask your questions and share our nursing perspective without taking too much of your time. Thanks for tuning in. Join us every week for TMI Tuesdays at 10 a.m. Eastern. Thank you for watching. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Who's going to do it? <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing my echo, actually. Really?